I believe I'm just going to call one more after this one. It would be brief. Where did you subpoena the, the nurse? Uh, okay. What day did I subpoena her? I'm trying to see if I have. It was before yesterday, right? Oh, quite a long time ago, back when all the subpoenas were issued in this case. I, uh, so you, you knew she was going to be testifying today? I did. And you knew that the attorney from Ascension was going to be here? I knew that either an attorney from Ascension or a contract. Explain to me why you didn't bring that up to me outside the presence of the jury at 8.30 before we brought them in. I just thought it was something that would be real neat to have them. not tell the court ahead of time and then have this attorney come and sit in the chair and then want to come up here and give me documents during this trial. I did not know the attorney was going to approach the bench to give documents. The well, you knew he was going to be here, right? I didn't know there was going to be an attorney, yes, here. And you knew that he had an issue with respect to HIPAA. You want to make this HIPAA statement in front of the jury. Don't play these games with me anymore. I, this is something that you should have brought up at 8.30 outside the presence of the jury. Well, Your Honor. Would you like me to have this conversation with you in front of the jury? Well, no, I think that would be detrimental to my client's interest for sure. Yeah, I think so too, and I think what you're doing is detrimental to this court's ability to efficiently run a trial. So if you have stuff that you need to bring to my attention, do it outside the presence of the jury ahead of time. Don't do it during the trial. You understand me? I, I, I do, Judge, and I did not mean to put the, judge, the court in any type of position. There is a concern with the, uh, specifically Julie Gretner being exempted from any type of sequestration, and I understand the court's ruling, but for a pure impeachment witness, I could only publicly, I believe in my client's best interest, offer out in advance little to no information because I was concerned about testimony being altered knowing that there was going to be somebody there to impeach. This court will not participate in trial by ambush. Plain and simple. I understand but, what you're saying. You didn't want anyone to know and you wanted to ambush him with it. I understand that. But don't ambush me. Well, it, it wasn't my intent, Judge, and I did not know that the attorney was going to approach the court and ask for an order to be signed. I did say I would ask the court for an order at the start of the testimony. And if they had one they wanted to be signed, I would ask the court to sign it at some point later. And if the court did, I'd e-file it. But I did not know that that was going to happen. And if you knew all that, you should have told me. Fair enough. I apologize to the court. I didn't mean to put you in any position. In what way you want to set, set the tone for the morning? And I was, I, what I'm telling you is that I, I don't expect that from you, and I want you to understand that I don't want it to happen again. Understood. Bring the jury in. Possible to get a read back of the last line that was said? He said he got back into his car and he left. Thank you. That's what I thought. I, I was trying to get to a point where it was a logical stopping point. Understood. Thank you. But if you want it read back, you can read it. No, no, sir. That's, that's what I thought. 
Where did you go after you left? Um, after, after I left uh, the residence, I proceeded towards my house. And did you make any steps along the way? I did. Now, why was it that you were going to go back to your house? Um, I didn't know who was coming back to the property, if anyone, uh, since the mechanic had put the scene. Uh, I didn't know if anyone was in the house. Uh, I did not feel safe staying there. Uh, and uh, my dog was at my house, and my son thought was also somebody sick. Yeah, excuse me, you're going to have to speak for it. My dog was at my house. My dog was also at my house, uh, and I knew somebody to take care of my dog. Did you think about calling 911 after you had left? I, I did not. I heard, I heard sirens. Uh, I made the assumption uh, that I was on the way. Uh, and that one of the neighbors had heard or witnessed what was happening, and that they, they had made the 911 call. And where did you then uh, drive to once you left? Uh, I headed south uh, and stopped in Fond du Lac. Do you recall where you stopped in Fond du Lac? I believe it was at the BP station at the inter uh, interchange of uh, 41 to 151. And why did you stop there? Um, I was about to run out of gas. Uh, and I was shaking, I was crying, I was confused. Uh, I went inside uh, to the bathroom. I washed my face off. Uh, and then I purchased a six pack of beer uh, and left. And why did you purchase a six pack of beer? To calm my nerves. Um, I couldn't stop shaking. I couldn't stop crying. Um, yeah, that's why. And where did you go after you had left? I headed towards um, Monticello, Wisconsin. Were you drinking the beers then while you drove back towards Monticello? Yes. Do you know how much you drank? Uh, I believe it was around five and a half. Did you call anybody on your way home? I did. Um, did you, oh, I'm sorry. Who did you call? I called Lee Hildegard. Why did you call Lee? Um, I, I told him that uh, he needed to go to my house and pick up my dog. Why did you want Lee to go pick up your dog? Um, I knew with me leaving the scene, uh, I was most likely going to be incarcerated. Did you have any prior training in law enforcement at all? Uh, that is correct. Um, I was stationed with uh, the military police out of the Twin Cities uh, for three years. And is it that prior experience is why you based your determination that you were going to be incarcerated for leaving? Correct. How many times, or how often, or how, how much of the ride home, or how many times did you call Lee Hildenorf? Was it just that once you testified about or more? No, there were multiple calls between me and him. Um, like, a, uh, Barbara had called me uh, at one point, so I had to let off the phone with him and called Lee back. Lee was trying to keep me on the phone the whole way. I know I lost uh, cell phone reception a couple times uh, throughout the area. Um, Lee, Lee used to be a veteran's, um, I guess you would call it distress uh, counselor, uh, and he knew how to keep me on the phone and talk me, talk me through, I guess, getting home. Now, you said a person named Vargo had called you. Do you know who this Vargo is? I do. Uh, First Sergeant Peter Vargo. And... Do you recall approximately how long you talked with Mr. Fargo? I don't uh, recall the approximately, but it was a uh, fairly short call. And what, if anything, did you tell Mr. Fargo that you recall? Uh, he had stated that he saw a bolo out for me. Um, he asked where I was going. I said I was on my way home. Um, he asked if I was all right. Uh, I cut all my responses short. Um, as I was five years senior to him uh, in standard military practice, 
you're not going to disclose the events or something like that to someone so junior to me. But you didn't feel someone, someone's what junior? Oh, junior. Now, do you recall anything else that you had told Lee Hildendorf during any of these conversations uh, regarding what had occurred? Uh, I told him I was ambushed. Uh, I told him I was attacked uh, by all three of them. I, I told him I had no clue why. I didn't know what was going on. Um, I was obviously uh, crying, confused. Did you make any statement to him regarding having fucked up? I did. Uh, I believe it was uh, that I told him I fucked up. I fucked up. I think I said it like three times to him. And why did you say that? Um, because I, I should have seen all the red flags. Uh, I ignored them. Um, basically, she led me into a trap, and I, I fucked up. What red flags are you referring to? Just uh, with the sequence of events of this certain individual had to work on this at this certain time. It had to be done then, my stuff being put by the side of the road. She knew how important my personal property was to me. She knew that uh, my ex-wife basically took everything from me in the divorce, destroyed certain of uh, military items of mine that can't be returned, I can't get them back. So at that point, is it fair to say you had some hindsight? I don't say yes. Now, what happened? Well, uh, sorry, Dad. At some point, did you approach the city of Madison? I did. What happened when you got into Madison? Um, I missed the interchange between uh, 151 to 9094 uh, and proceeded straight down through uh, basically the city and got lost. And do you know how long you were lost for Madison? Um, no, I stopped and hit uh, my directions into my phone, which took me back out through. Stoughton Road uh, through Buckeye, Manila, and back onto the bell line. And eventually, did you arrive, arrive home? I did. Where else did you pass through on the way home that you recall? Um, from Madison, I took the route that takes me from uh, Verona through Paoli and then through uh, New Glarus and then to my residence. And did you arrive back at your residence? I did. And what happened when you got back to your residence? Uh, I turned left into my driveway. I saw the spike strips uh, laid out in front of my gate. Uh, and I stopped um, before we ran over the spike strips, uh, at which point uh, all, the, all the cherries popped on from the police officers. So what did you, when we say cherries, you refer to the sirens? I mean, the, the lights? The lights, no sirens. What did you do once you observed the, the lights? Um, put my vehicle in park, uh, turned off the ignition. What happened next? Um, I put down my uh, driver's side window, I believe, uh, and heard the officers yelling commands um, to get out of the vehicle. What did you do? Um, I got out of the vehicle. And were you given additional orders from officers? Correct. Um, they told me to proceed backwards towards them and then get down on the ground. Was there another firearm in the car other than the one that you had uh, carried? There was. And what firearm was that? Uh, my Taurus charge. And what, if anything, did you do with that? That's, uh, that's my farm gun. Um, basically, my, my farm truck was broke down. I always keep a gun in the farm truck um, for critters that are doing damage uh, to foundations and whatnot on the property. You didn't attempt to arm yourself in any way with that? No, I did not. Did you still have your carrying concealed weapon pistol on you at the time that you got out of the vehicle? I did. It was in my left front pocket. And 
What, if anything, did you do with that? Um, once the officers uh, had me on the ground, I tried to explain to them that it was in my left front pocket and tried to hand it over to them. Did you attempt to resist the officers at all? No, I did not. Is this what you were expecting? Yes. Now, at some point then, were you transported to the Winnebago County Jail? I was. While in jail, did you attempt to make any phone calls to an Aaron Spice? I did. How do you, who's Aaron Spice? Uh, Aaron Spice is known as Chief Warrant Officer 2 Spice. Uh, He's known as, I'm sorry. Chief Warrant Officer 2 uh, Spice, who I served with in the military, uh, close friend of mine, from the Green Bay area. Why did you call, or do you call making a call to Aaron on or about August 19th? I do. And why did you call him? Um, during my initial, um, I guess, week, two weeks at uh, Winnebago County Jail, I was put in a isolation cell. Uh, the isolation cell has a camera in one corner of it um, that monitors your activities. Um, and I was um, writing down on a piece of paper all of the events that I could um, go through that happened that night during that first week so that I could turn my statement into an attorney once I was appointed to one. Um, and I heard the corrections officers talking about items that were on my statement. And one of those items on my statement that they were talking about was um, I had indicated that uh, Rebecca had a weapon and a pistol and I was writing down the sequence of events. Um, they were reading it and I could hear them commenting about what I was writing. Um, and one of them had made a comment that there was no gun found at the scene, right? Um, to which I was confused because there was a gun. Um, I'm going to object to the extent that he's testifying to hear say about what some officer allegedly said. It's foundational, Your Honor, as to why he made this call to Aaron Spice that was initially, I think, discussed or brought out with Detective Artis. I'll sustain the objection. So, did you make a phone call to Aaron Spice then on that date? I did. Now, is there any type of message that you give him prior to making a phone call from the Winnebago County Jail? Any type of message as in? Any type of notice or warning that you're giving him making a phone call? No. Are you advised of anything about it being recorded? Oh, you know yes, yes. Uh, when you pick up the phone and, and dial out, it says that this call uh, will be recorded and may be used for future use. Did that have any impact on the reason why you called here in Spice? It did. Um, I was finding out uh, the information from the corrections officers. I wanted to relay certain aspects of what I was hearing to Chief Warrant Officer Spice because um, I knew someone was listening to the phone calls uh, and I wanted to get out certain details because no one had really come to talk to me other than I was being charged with homicide. What details did you tell Aaron Spice? Uh, I told him that a weapon apparently went missing from the scene. I had told him um, that I was attacked by three individuals. Um, I also told him that it seemed like it was I was set up to get screwed over that night, uh, and that uh, it seemed like it was planned by someone. Police report is relevant to what this witness is going to be testifying to. Your Honor, goes towards the relevance. The relevance goes towards when I questioned Detective Artis if he had any cause to believe that there was a weapon missing at the time that the missing firearm was turned in by Rebecca, and I tried to get in the conversation that he overheard Joshua aid state and that was uh, objected to the objection was sustained 
And on the grounds that I could ask Joshua Aid what he had told Aaron Spice. And this is the memorialization of that. Who memorialized it? Detective Dean Artis. I'll sustain the objection. Now, Josh, I want to take you back to September 2018. Okay. Were you dating with Rebecca in the dating relationship at that point? I was. Now, do you recall an incident that occurred in September of 2018 that was testified to here uh, by Rebecca? I do. And do you recall what you know the day she's talking about? I do. And what was happening that day? Um, I was making a uh, primer supper um, for her and Leo Lior. And did something happen between you and Rebecca? Um, she um, pulled a gun on me. There was no, no argument. Um, and like that, I was in the kitchen cooking, uh, and I proceeded from the kitchen into my wood stove room, uh, at which point she had uh, my Taurus judge pointed at me. Taurus, and what is the second word? Taurus what? Judge. Oh. Do you know why she had that pointed at you? I do not. What happened after you, you observed her pointing the Taurus at you? I reached out with my left hand, uh, grabbed the gun, pushed to the side, with my right hand, I reached out and grabbed her by the throat, uh, depressing in a submissive move to make her um, lose grip of the weapon, uh, at which point um, we tumbled to the ground and I threw the weapon onto the futon. When you say depressing in a submissive move, uh, move what are you talking about? Uh, applying pressure to the, the throat to make someone want to drop what's in their hand. And then you said you two fell to the ground? That is correct. What happened after you fell to the ground? Um, I yelled, call 911, uh, because I believe that uh, Lee was present at the scene. Um, and I got up, and she ran out the door and said, have fun with your little fucking friend. Did you let her go, or did you let her net go, or the move go after she dropped the gun? I did. Do you know how you two ended up on the ground? Yes, um, we basically fell to the ground. Is that the first time that you would have touched her in such a manner? Yes. Was that the first time she pointed a gun at you? It is not. Was there another incident she appointed you then? There is. Uh, in 2016-2017, uh, when she had an apartment in Oshkosh, uh, I was in her apartment sitting on the couch, uh, which faces um, a hallway that went towards her bedroom. Uh, this was around the same time that I'd uh, given her the money to purchase her concealed carry pistol. She asked if I wanted to see it. Uh, I said yes. She went to her bedroom, retrieved it, came back out, and had it pointed at my chest when she appeared from the hallway. And what did you do? Uh, I was sitting down on the couch, so there's no way I could disarm from it. Um, I said, not funny, let me see the pistol. Uh, at which point she handed it over to me. Was the pistol loaded after she handed it over to you? It was not. Now, you heard testimony during the trial from Detective Artist talking about a phone call that you had made to Lee Hildendorf regarding uh, Rebecca pointing a gun and you having to make that sound good or something to that effect. Do you recall that? I do. Did you make that phone call with Lee? I did. And what was it that you were talking about with Lee? Do you recall the incident? Uh, that would be in an uh, incident in 2019. Um, when she pointed a gun at Lee. And you had observed that? I did not. 
you weren't talking about this incident. I was not. No further questions. Thank you. Now you've just testified to two incidents where you're claiming that Rebecca pointed a gun at you, correct? I am. You talked to her in a Facebook conversation the day before day before you shot her in the head, where you said to her, you've never felt physically abused by her. You said that, or you acknowledged that, right? I would have to see the text, but I do not disagree if you're saying I said that. I'm going to show you what's been marked states. Is it at 24? Turn to page 13 there. And at the top, you say to her, what about all the abuse you put me through? All mental, no physical. Do you ever think about that? I see that. So she's never physically abused you, right? Pointing a gun at me does not constitute physical abuse because it's not hands-on, if that's what you're saying. Would you qualify that as mental abuse? No, I don't know how you would qualify it. Well, when she challenges you on that, she says, no, please explain how I mentally abused you if you want. The only thing that you point to her as her abuse to you in this relationship would be, hmm, helping me cause a divorce and constantly calling me a drunk. Nowhere in there do you reference she has frightened you by threatening you with weapons, do you? I do not. And this was the day before the incident where you shot her in the head? I don't see a timestamp on it, but yes, I'll agree with that. So you'd agree that as of that date, the only abuse you felt she engaged in in the past would be to cause your divorce and call you a drunk? And point of weapons at me, but I did not specifically call that out in this. No. Right, you didn't say that anywhere at all, did you? I did not. Okay. And because Rebecca, you felt Rebecca caused your divorce, you felt entitled to have her forever, didn't you? No, not even close. Well, going back to your text from 2018, you do acknowledge that you physically abused her, right? Yes. That was related to the weapons incident when I put my hand on her and grabbed her by the throat. So in these texts from 2018, around the time of that incident, these are September to October of 2018, she's writing to you, she says, let me remind you, you physically hurt me, slammed me to the ground, in addition choked me. I'm sick and fucking tired of the abuse. Your head is clearly in a different place than mine. No regard for me at fucking all. And you want kids with me? I won't put my kids through that situation. You don't know what to do. Take care of your bettering yourself to start. She writes that to you, right? She does. 
And right after that, she then also says, I love you, Josh. I want you to know that. Sure. But you understand that sometimes women who are abused can still love the person who's abusing them, right? I do. So then she follows up with that by saying, you also told me we will work this out. Josh, do you even understand what you really did, mentally or physically? Putting your hands on me like that. My throat still hurts to this day. Tonight, right now. It's been over two weeks. Telling me, I don't know if I treat you like a Marine or what. Well, that's nice, First Sergeant. Treat junior Marines like an enemy combatant and choke them so they can feel your pain. You said that, right? I wish you could feel the anger I have deep inside of me. A female Marine at that. Outstanding job. I'm so mad at you for treating me like your family instead of your partner, your friend. You hate your family, and all I've been trying to do is bring out the best in you for us. She says that to you, right? She does. And at no point do you challenge her and say, I was just trying to protect myself from you, do you? I do not, because that conversation would have went nowhere. This was also in the time where she was okay, let me just follow up with asking you the question. So, well, Your Honor, I would object. I'd ask that the witness be allowed to answer the question without interruption. So, when we move on, she states to you in that same string, before I go to bed, I need you to promise me something. Correct. And you say, okay, boo. She asks you to promise to never put your hands on her like that again, ever. And what is your response? Promise. Okay. And again, at no point in this exchange do you reference Rebecca abusing you or scaring you with a gun, correct? I do not. Okay. And Rebecca says to you, I can't communicate to you how I ever really feel, but you put your hands on me again. So I really have nothing to lose, I guess, except my life, maybe. Your temper, anger, rage, being drunk all the time. You try to control me, you put your hands on me. So you would agree that that comment indicates she was the one in fear for her life during that incident, correct? That is what she is trying to portray. Well, then when she writes to you, you respond to this one, so we'll go through it. I want to think you didn't mean to cause me sorrow or pain. I want to think you want me to be happy. I tell myself you want what's best for me to see you in the sun, to be my friend and lover. You told me some things the other night, things that made you sad and angry, yet you did them to me. You told me what happened between us is how your mom and dad were. That's not love or a healthy relationship. That is revenge. That is not me. I don't want to be in an abusive relationship. I hate you deeper than one can describe. We will not last, Josh, if this is how it is with you. I can't. I deserve more than that. Not because I'm entitled, but because I respect myself and my own experience and hatred towards certain things. And then you go on to say, I understand I'm not my parents. I refuse to live that life. Also, we need to fix it through communication. I need to execute a few stress-related changes on my side because I can't live like this, and it's it's unfair to you that I'm losing control. That's what you wrote to her, right? It is. Fair to say she wasn't the one who lost control that night, you were? That would be an inaccurate statement. My losing control was in reflection of my personal life and how much work Okay, has... well, in this text exchange, you never correct her or say, no, Rebecca, you were the one with the gun. You never do that, do you? I do not. And if anything, this appears to acknowledge exactly what Rebecca had reported happened, correct? I would disagree. Okay. Well, you did provide you did provide an affidavit when you first made this claim about Rebecca pointing the gun at you. Do you remember doing that? I don't remember the date specifically. Uh, well, I can show it to you, but it looks like you provided this statement in act on uh, a October 27th of 2020. So I'm just going to show it to you to re refresh, excuse me, refresh your recollection.
Do you remember signing that? I do. And you referenced the 2018 incident where Rebecca allegedly pointed a gun at you? I do. And you acknowledge that nowhere in her do you indicate that you had to strangle her to remove the gun from her? This is a summary of the document that I wrote for my lawyer. Therefore, that portion is not in there. Nor did I say in the portion that I hand broke him that I strangled her. I said that I placed my hand on her throat in a fashion to make it compliant to remove well, it. Well, it doesn't reference any sort of hand on her throat or anything like that in that affidavit that you signed, does it? It does not. Okay. Fair to say that you got a chance to look at these texts that confirmed exactly what Rebecca reported, and now you're changing your story a little bit because there's really no way around this? That's not changing my story at all. to the spring of 2020, you were pretty upset about Rebecca leaving you, right? I would say confused. Um, she left me in March uh, after coming down to my house and taking... Okay, that's enough. Just the, just the answer. So you wanted her back, right? I wanted more of a understanding of why she decided to break up the relationship now want her back. But you'd agree that you repeatedly asked her to get back together. I repeatedly asked her how she could throw away five years and that I didn't understand it. No, nowhere can I place that I said I want to get back together. she repeatedly told you that she didn't want to get back in the relationship, right? I would disagree. Okay. Um, there are a series of text messages where she's saying I'm not sure how long she's breaking up with me for. Uh, she would call me. Did you repeatedly, after she'd broken up with you, repeatedly ask her about other men in her life? Just at the end of uh, this towards the 72985, when she had gotten the new Jeep, I was just joking with her and said, is this your boyfriend? then call me back because you're lying about the other, being on the other line. I did. And she says she's not, and you indicate I don't trust you. Correct. And she again says, well, I'm on the, on the other line, and you indicate with your new boyfriend. I did say that. And she tells you no. Correct. So as of that date, 
the second, which is two days before the shooting, you were concerned about her having a new boyfriend? I had no concerns about her having a new boyfriend. That is correct. Had she blocked you on Facebook to try to keep you out of her life previously? She had not. She took her Facebook page down for VA purposes. Uh, she was applying for a loan or something. So you're asking though if she opened it back up? I'm asking uh, if she turned it back on, yes. Okay. And then she changed her, face, her dating status to single? Correct which she would repeatedly do throughout our relationship, whether we were in a relationship, in the on or off stages of it, she would constantly flip that. I was just making a general comment. Were you pretty upset to see that? I was not. On page two, um, it's the last page of your statement, you Which one is that? The first full paragraph that you write to her. Yes, I wrote, uh, maybe you found someone better, I don't know. And you also write, I went through a divorce to be with you, and for you to now walk away, I'm fucking crushed, completely demoralized. That is true. And moving on to page three, you had asked her if her new boyfriend helped her pay for her Jeep. I did. And I, when she responds no, you ask her if she's admitting she has a new boyfriend? I did. I was curious at the time how she was able to afford a new Jeep with always having bills in medical collections and her... You'd agree that that's none of your business if she broke up a few five months ago, right? Correct. Okay. So moving on to page nine, it looks like you're getting upset that she's not responding back to you quick enough and you, you write to her no response back yet you can reply to Joseph Joseph. I was not getting mad at her. That was just a standardized comment because I was trying to get a hold of her and she was replying back to other people I could see. So you were watching her Facebook page too for what time she was communicating with? No. It shows you if you're online, they're online, and I was typing messages. Okay. Now also on page nine you indicate, my gut is telling me you already found someone else. It's a slow feeling. I've been feeling it for a while. And when she responds she's single, you indicate single does not mean dating, not dating. That is correct. There was also a period in text messages where Wait she a minute, I'll have another question for you in a minute. So moving on to page twelve, you write, hopefully the next boyfriend treats you better than I do. And then you suggest, hey, I think Vinny is single. That is correct. And then you suggest that she's probably already looked at that path? That is correct. Now, isn't it true that on the day of the shooting, you believe that John Miller was her boyfriend? No, I did not believe he was her boyfriend. I said that on Facebook, I believe, because I was trying to find out who this mechanic was that was a family friend. But you did suggest to her that he was her boyfriend. 
in a joking manner. Nothing that concerns me at all. Okay. Well, after you call John, I'm referring to page 20 here. Page 20 of what document? The, face, the Facebook Messenger Exchange. Rebecca appears to respond to you after learning that you had called John Miller and told him not to come to her house. And then you respond, is he your new boyfriend because he ain't a certified mechanic? That is true. Okay. And Rebecca tells you, you don't get to choose who comes to my house. He can replace the radiator, right? That is correct. Okay. And then it's you who responds to her. You don't get to choose who comes to mine, right? I did. And then she says, that's fine. Your stuff will be dropped off by the road then, right? Correct. So you knew she was coming down the following weekend to drop off all your stuff? Not from that text. And the text that I had sent Scott Balthazar, he asked if it was going to be left on the side of the road at my house or her house. And I replied, I don't know yet. But this would indicate she's dropping it off. Your stuff will be dropped off by the road then, because you just told her she's not allowed on your property, right? I didn't say she wasn't allowed on my property. I said she doesn't have to choose who comes. And I didn't know if she was leaving it on the road by her house, which she has done some of my property before, and people come and take it, or if she was actually intentionally delivering it all. Because I did well, also know okay. that two SUVs hey, would not carry all of that stuff. Let me stuff. stop you for a minute. So you don't clarify with that with her. You just again go back to whether John Miller is her boyfriend. Correct. Then you respond, he must be sitting right next to you, huh? I did say that because the time stamps on how quick she was responding didn't make sense to me. So you believe this other man was sitting with her? I believe they had to be in close proximity for her to respond that quickly to my phone call to him. And that was upsetting to you? Not at all. Okay. She writes to you, Josh, we are never getting back together. You have issues, right? She does. You respond again. Is he sitting right next to you, me and John Miller? I do. She responds, still being abusive and controlling and intimidating. What page are you on now? Page 21. Correct. And I replied, not abusive or controlling at all. All I want get done right and going independent contractor is not right. Okay. Then she tells you, leave me alone. Correct. Okay. And then I state I'll have a pay to be done right by the professional. Sure to say from Rebecca's comments, she wasn't inviting you there in any manner that day. She's telling you, I want you gone. I don't want you at my house. But on the phone call that we had that evening at 1726 minutes, um, she knew I was coming to her house because I had told her that if she needed anything to finish the repairs, um, let me know. So do you mean after she repeatedly told you, I don't want you here, I'm having this done myself, I don't need your help, are you saying just because you told her that you were going to come, she should have just known you were going to be there? after she told you this many times not to come, she doesn't want you. She placed that call to me. She knew I was on my way. Is it fair to say that you were pretty controlling over Rebecca during the relationship? Absolutely not. We were two and a half hours away. There's nothing I could control. Okay, you've got um, Exhibit 23 in front of you. you Thank you. Move to page 34. Okay. Rebecca writes to you, I did think about moving in with you. I have for a long time, but you're controlling, and I don't like how it makes me feel. And you're more controlling and angry when you drink. It's stressful and not healthy, and apparently you can't talk to me because I always get mad, so you just hold it in, and then blow up at some point, also not healthy. And you don't think I have been there by your side, even though I have been trying to be understanding from day one, even through all of your anger and excessive drinking. 
you respond to that saying, I'm not controlling at one point in our relationship, yes, because I fear you driving away and not coming back. That was your response. Part of your response, yes. So you have been controlling her throughout the relationship. You acknowledged it to some extent. That was in response to when she lived with me for four months, and the driving away and not coming back was in response to her excessive drinking and then wanting to go driving. And I was fearful that she would wrap her car around the tree. Sure, but you would, you're, what you're saying there is that you acknowledge being controlling. I know you want to explain it now, but that's what the text says, right? That is. Now, you had just testified previously that you weren't really trying to get her back in the relationship, so I'd like to go into that a little bit more. The Facebook exchange, if you turn to page nine. Now, we talked a little bit about your feelings about this Joseph Joseph talking to Rebecca on Facebook. Rebecca responds, Josh, what the fuck? Why do, you, why do I always need to explain myself to you? We are not together. And you respond, but it seems you two are, right? Correct. And then you continue responding, he just sent you four more photos. I'm trying to fix what we had, and you keep you keep just telling me we are not together, right? Correct. So you were trying to get her back in a relationship, right? No. Okay. Well, she responds, kind of seems like you're stalking. Who cares what someone posted on Facebook or who I am talking to about a vehicle? Seriously immature. And your response then is, not immature at all. I want this relationship fixed, and I'm extremely frustrated. And no, I'm not taking it out on you, but my gut is telling me that you already found someone else. So you did admit that you wanted the relationship fixed and you were extremely frustrated with Rebecca that day. I did say that. So now would you agree that you were trying to get her back in the relationship? No, I said I wanted the relationship fixed. Okay. I didn't say if it was a dating relationship, a friend relationship. That was on Monday, the day before you shot Rebecca in the head? I don't, I don't see a date on it. It's on the previous page. And your next message then is that you want to talk to her about a future, and you're talking about saving a pot for a wedding, and that she deserves a nice wedding, right? That was correct because that went back to December 2019 on our way to Vegas. She asked me to marry her uh, on our way out there. Okay. Well, now she's broken up with you, but you're still trying to get her back in the relationship, correct? No, I was just explaining uh, things that she didn't know that I had been saving her for. Okay. So then you state to her, maybe we could talk about a path forward or how to fix things? Correct. And you do reference Saturday afternoon, she's supposed to be dropping all of your stuff off, and you ask her if that's a step in the direction of closure for her, right? Correct. And she just indicates that they'll be there by 10 o'clock, right? Correct. Then you go through a list of things that she's returning, and then you want to get back to your question about closure. So on page 12, you're indicating, so back to my question, you won't answer, is this closure for you, right? Yes. And Rebecca says, I think so. Correct. And you write, so no hope of us fixing this relationship we had? Correct. And she indicates you're asking the same shit different ways? Correct. 
she also indicates, Josh, I don't want what we had. We had a long distance relationship for five years. Alcohol, verbal, physical abuse, and fear is not what I want in my life. Correct. And then on page 14, you try to go back to the issue again, indicating to her that we invested so much time into each other, it's sad to see you abandon that. Correct. You ask, you then state to her, all I'm asking is that we give it another try. I did it that. Now, you've heard the suggestion in this case that Rebecca wanted you for your house or for your money. So I'd like to just address that next message that you sent to her. So you're writing, all I'm asking is we get another try. I got it, five years of long distance is a lot. But that's where we failed each other, not to meet in the middle and find a mutual home. Financially, I could probably turn out a pretty good, pretty, turn out pretty good on the sale of my dad's in this place. I don't want to be here forever. It's a bad zone for me. And that is a down payment for a real home, not the shithole I live in. And she responds, I was and still am too afraid to move in with you. I lived with you for a few months and I was scared, right? That is true. So fair to say you're the one suggesting selling your properties and trying to get her to move in with you, right? That is incorrect. In a text message to me in November 2019, I'm just talking about after the breakup. So we're kind of focusing on when you shot her in the head and what came immediately before that. So as of that point, she didn't want your house, she didn't want your money, she didn't want you, correct? That would be what disappears. And is it fair to say that that issue with Rebecca wanting nothing to do with you was to be finalized the weekend of August 8th with her returning all of your things, returning this Cap Tahoe, and just being done with you, correct? Correct. And from all the text messages that we've been reading, You'd agree that you didn't want that to happen? I would disagree. And from what we can actually view in your exchange, you'd agree that from everything we can see here, it appears that Rebecca did not want you to come to her home on August 4th, right? That is not what she stated on the phone to me. But I just, understand what the text messages state. Okay, so you'd agree that in the messages, it looks pretty clear here that she did not want you there on August 4th. She stated to leave me alone and uh, that I can't choose who goes to her property. I will agree to that, yes. And I can't choose who goes to her property. And you heard her testify as well that she told you by phone she didn't want anything to do with you either, right? What's that? She told, you heard her testify that she had told you on August 4th that she didn't want anything to do with you, right? She told you that by phone? She did not tell me that by phone. But that's what she testified to, right? She did testify to saying that. And in fact, on page 19 of that tax exchange, and this would be on Tuesday with a, an exchange that started around 1.18 p.m. You even suggest to her that you be someone who drives up and helps her with that tackle, right? Correct. And at that point, she declines, right? She says she found a mechanic, no need to drive up here? 
Correct. So you'd agree from all the evidence that the jury has seen, everything would indicate that you were not invited there. The only conflicting evidence is your statement that she invited you in a phone call, right? I would agree that uh, the text messages, she said, no need to drive up here. And based on the text messages she's sending you about this exchange happening the following weekend, that would indicate that she's doing something to drop off your house, at, drop off your property at your house that following weekend, right? Correct. And that would be inconsistent with some conspiracy she actually had in her mind to kill you, right? What's that? That, that those statements where she's telling you she's going to drop off your stuff the following weekend, that's inconsistent with your theory that she has plans to kill you that day, right? I do not know that. Now, you say that she invited you over in a phone call, right? I, I said that I would be able to pick up anything that they needed. Uh, and she said that she would let me know, yes. Okay. So she didn't really invite you over, she just said if she needed anything, she'd let you know? Correct, because I was heading off that way, yes. Okay. So you'd agree then that she didn't invite you even by phone? I would disagree with that statement. But you just said, she said she'd let you know if she needed anything, right? Right, because I was heading up that way to inspect to make sure that the work was done properly since it was going to be returned to my residence. So you basically just told her you were coming to her residence? I asked if she needed anything because I was coming up. And when she indicated that you don't get to choose who comes to her property, did you have any belief that you would be welcome on her property that day? I didn't. I understand why it wouldn't be. That was in reflection to the phone call that I had with the mechanic saying not to perform the work because he was not served by the mechanic. But you knew he was going to perform the work, right? Uh, from what I understand, yes, she was still going to have him perform the work. Okay. And so fair to say you knew Rebecca didn't want you at her property then if she was just going to do this work and have her mechanic friend do it? I would disagree. Well, let's talk a little bit more about the call log here. So, so you'd agree that there were five completed calls between the two of you the day that you shot these three people? Correct. And You'd also agree that Rebecca only called you three times that day? It appears that way. And you tried to call her over 40 times that day? Correct. And you even expressed anger at her towards your friend, Balthazar? No, that was not anger. Well, you said Becky's really pissing you off, right? I did. Okay. And that was around 4.30? Correct. I had to take a break for lunch. Cinco de Mayo, so I think we have tacos for you. Both the books, all right, for the jury?
these units. Back here, 1240. And when the trial's done, I'm going to buy both of you a shirt that says, so fair to say. The difference being one of you is on direct, one of you is on cross examination. But we both use that phrase. Right now. And after I said that to Mr. Seaman, one of the first questions you asked was, so it's fair to say, and I saw a national history. What does Mike Lim say? I can start using that one. I, I, I say fantastic all the time. And fantastic day. My quarter Alright, we'll be back here 12.40. Have a good lunch.